You hear me? No, that's not close enough, huh? Actually, you can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not in the house. Yeah, because I'm not hearing the. Um... We'll do an audio check here for in the house, and you're good. You can. Okay. Can people in the audience hear me? I'm not. I don't I'm know. Hearing it. I can't hear. We're doing an audio check. Can anybody hear Jennifer in the back? I don't. I don't want to shout. Yeah, I don't think it's on. Um, it's it's muted. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Or now it's muted. How about now? Uh, How about now? I I, I can tell you. Yeah. Is it? All right. How is that in the house? How about now? Check. Is the mic? Oh, that sounds. It's on. Okay. Good. We'll just have to remember to turn it back to fifty percent. Keep talk, talk, check, check, talking. Check, talking. We love Is talking about talking. It's a fascinating <laughs> evening tonight. Free ice cream. Free ice yeah, cream. okay. Free ice cream. I got to get the lid to go down on it. So there's orange custard chocolate chip, which is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. And then there's vanilla, because even orchids need to have a utility in life. <laughs> What's that? I like vanilla. I, I think it gets an unfair yeah. reputation. Would you like one? To... Not right now. <laughs> I, I'll get a frog in my throat. Well, <laughs> most of us just eat the eggs, the legs. <laughs> I blew that line. Darn. Who makes the wheelchairs for all the Michael's frogs? Engineering students. <laughs> Maybe they just become tadpoles again. All right. Jennifer, can you say a few words again? Testing whether the mic is on. Perfect. Is it? Can you turn your mic off for a second? Off? Oh. No, she wants oh. me to turn mine off. We're also talking to an engineer over at Mindless. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Any other free advice you'd like to give? <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for coming tonight. Next week, we're going to have back-to-back -back dairy science, because it's going to be June Dairy Month in about five hours. Uh, Laura Hernandez, Alicia Vang, and Ariana Negriero we're going to be here, are going to be here from Animal and Dairy Sciences, and they're going to talk about how data scientists and lactation biologists develop new ways to predict lactation potential in mammals. On June 14th, Kelly Senecal from Engineering Interdisciplinary Professional Programs will be here to talk on the futures of the internal combustion engine. And then on June 21st, we're going to have a special edition of Wednesday Night at the Lab, not here, but across the street, not here in 425 Henry Mall, but across the street in 420 Henry Mall in the big auditorium. Uh, Grace Stanky, who's the current uh, Miss America and who's a nuclear engineering student here, is going to give a special Wednesday Night at the Lab. It's also part of the new summer uh, academy that the Positive Youth Development Institute of the Division of Extension is going to be organizing. So you can come here, but then turn around and go the other direction. I think we're going to have about 250 youth from all over Wisconsin there. That place seats 400, so I think we'll be doing pretty great. And I think the crew will be there for that also. All right. And then on... Uh, the 28th of June, Jim Lattice is going to be here from UW Space Place, and that's going to be part of this. Every year we've got, had a meteorology 
summer camp for high school kids that uh, wasn't able to take play place the last couple of summers, but this year we're back on. So if you know Jim, uh, he helps run Space Place, the Washington Observatory. He's got great stories to tell about um, the observatories. And anytime you're ready, I'll start. Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jennifer Van Oss. She's a professor in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences. She's going to be speaking with us about giving dairy cows a voice through science. She was born in Champaign-Urbana, and she went to Uni High School there on the campus of the University of Illinois. She went to Harvard and got her undergraduate degree in psychology, and then went to the University of California, Davis, to get a PhD in animal behavior. She postdoced at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and then came to UW-Madison in 2018 to be on the faculty in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences. Looking forward to this talk tonight. Would you please join me in welcoming Jennifer Van Oss to Wednesday Night at the Lab. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom, for the introduction and for having me. I'm thrilled to be here tonight and appreciate everyone who's joining us either here in person or tuning in otherwise. So as uh, the introduction mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences here on campus, and I also am an extension specialist in dairy cattle welfare. So it really is truly a dream job to be here in America's dairy land to study dairy cattle. It really is the most amazing place to be, not only because we have so many dairy cows, but so many passionate dairy farmers, many of whom are alumni of UW-Madison and have gone back into the industry. So as an extension specialist, when I arrived here five years ago, I went around to dairy producer meetings and I visited farms with colleagues who had been more established with Wisconsin's dairy industry to talk to farmers and try to understand, first of all, what did they think animal welfare meant so we could get on the same page, and what were they proud of when it came to animal care, but also what were the challenges they were facing so that I could make sure that the research I do in my lab is applicable to the state of Wisconsin's dairy industry. And so that's why I'm showing the picture here. Um, this is a picture of me on a Wisconsin dairy farm about 45 minutes drive from here where I was trying to solve some practical problems that they had with their ventilation system. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. So I like to say that I don't have a traditional teaching appointment here on campus, even though I do work with our undergraduate students, but I do my teaching in the field. And I also do my learning in the field because it's essential that the research we do doesn't occur in a vacuum and we don't just have these fanciful ivory tower ideas that aren't applicable to the industry. But above all, I think it's not only important to talk to the farmers to make sure that the research addresses their needs, but we need to talk to our animals. And so that's why I titled my talk, Giving, a Cows, Giving Cows a Voice Through Science. That's the unofficial motto in my lab. And so through this talk, I'll take you on a journey so that hopefully you'll understand what I mean by that. So to start with a little bit of terminology, I think animal welfare is something that almost everybody has some kind of notion of. But my goal today is to show you how we study this scientifically. So frameworks that we use in the field of animal welfare science, as well as the different techniques that we use to give cows a voice and understand what they need to experience good welfare. So if we break down the word welfare, we're asking how well an animal is faring. So an animal can be faring well, an animal can be faring poorly, or somewhere in between. It's a spectrum, and it refers to the animal's status. And so that's why you can see it's actually the downstream outcome. Um, and what happens upstream is the care that's provided by the humans that are 
um, caring for these animals. So in this case, we're talking about dairy farmers. So dairy farmers are the ones who are providing the housing environments, using certain husbandry practices, and directly interacting with the animals on a daily basis. So when we talk about animal care, those are the inputs into the system and the actions that humans take. And then one of the outcomes is animal welfare or what the animal themselves experiences. So to bring this back to what I see my objective in my job is, is to conduct integrated research and extension projects. So what I mean by that is I like to conduct very applied research. I think basic science is absolutely essential. You hear a lot about that here week to week. But what keeps me going is the idea that the knowledge that we can gain is useful to the dairy industry and for improving the lives of animals. And so I integrate that with my extension outreach to make sure that that research doesn't only end up in a library and is used by other scientists, but also gets out there and can hopefully help farmers and help dairy cows. And so the next step after conducting this research and doing extension outreach is to help us improve our understanding of dairy cattle welfare. What is it that dairy cows or calves need to have a good quality of life? And then that, that can inform best practices for the dairy industry that's founded on the latest scientific evidence. And so when I talk about best practices, what do I mean by that? So this can really vary. From region to region, there are different regulations. In some cases, those can be legislated. In other areas, these standards are determined in different ways. So here in the United States, there is a program, which I think a lot of people outside of the dairy industry might not have heard of, but it's called FARM, which stands for Farmers Assuring Responsible Management. And this has been around for a while, but it's evolved over time. So when it started over a decade ago, it was a voluntary dairy producer education program, similar to what's called Beef Quality Assurance, or BQA, which is a rough equivalent in the beef industry, but now these programs have diverged and they have a different sort of model. But they are funded by what's called the dairy checkoff. So every time you buy a dairy product, a small portion of those proceeds goes to this national program um, that funds dairy marketing, but also this program called FARM. And so with farmers assuring responsible management, there are different pillars. So this has expanded and now includes things like environmental stewardship or workforce development to help dairy farmers develop their employees um, in terms of their professional development. But the original goal of the farm program was what's called animal care. And so this is their flagship program. It's still going today. And as we speak now, 99% of dairy farms in the US participate through the co-ops or processors to which they sell milk. So essentially, it functions as a way for farmers to maintain their market. And so it establishes this uniform standard that all, almost all dairy farms in the US agree to adhere to. And again, this is just a minimum bar, so farms can go above and beyond if they choose to. But it's a way for the dairy industry to proactively say as a profession, we agree that we all need to treat cows a certain way at minimum, and we can also do even better. So this is just one quotation taken from the website of this program, which is that it aims to raise the bar for the entire U.S. dairy industry by establishing dairy animal welfare management guidelines. So there is a booklet, it's the manual, and it's publicly available freely online. You can go see it's about a 100-page <laughs> PDF document. And this is updated on normally a three-year cycle because of the pandemic, it's offset a little bit. So we're currently in what's called version four, of the farm program, and then version five will go into effect about a year from now. So I sit on what's called the Animal Care Task Force. And so this is a committee of different people across the US that includes academics, welfare scientists such as myself, veterinarians, dairy producers, and representatives from these co-ops and processors. And it's important that we have this diversity of viewpoints and diversity of expertise so that we can make sure that these requirements are science-based but also practical and achievable for the dairy industry. And one of the mottos of the farm program is continuous improvement. So continuous improvement in terms of animal care practices used on the farm. So encouraging this bar to always grow higher as we learn more and more about animal welfare science, but also continuous improvement of the program. So acknowledgement that there is kind of a learning curve in terms of establishing a national standard and trying to make this program more and more rigorous. 
So I just want to point out that the work that I do, um, it isn't just idealistic. It's not just me out there alone. There are other welfare scientists, veterinarians, people who study animal health, animal welfare. And our goal is to make sure that this information is accessible and that the expectations that we have of farmers are grounded in science, but also are informed by the farmers' voices as well. But going back to my lab's motto, we seek to give the cows a voice through science. I think it really comes down to that because cows are different from humans. So I think it's important that we not just anthropomorphize, which means projecting what we as humans think is good or that we would want onto cows. I think that that can be a way to generate hypotheses, but we have to remember that different species are different and that cows' needs aren't necessarily the same as that of people. So when we think about understanding the animals, we can use different scientific disciplines. So what I've shown here is different people examining a cow. And so you can collect these traditional production measures. How much milk is a cow producing? What kind of components in terms of fat and protein? And I think that that is important from an economic perspective since dairying is a business. But it also is important to understand other aspects of the cow holistically. So this can be the underlying physiological mechanisms, which is what many of my colleagues in the Department of Animal and Dairy Science study. But my training for my PhD is in animal behavior. And so I think it's important to observe the cows and give them opportunities to tell us, even though they can't speak English, we may eventually have some kind of instantaneous Moogle translate um, device that can let us really speak cow. But essentially, I see it as my job to ask questions in a clever way so that we can infer what the cow is telling us. So I have a two-year-old daughter, and one of her very favorite board books is called How to Speak Moo. <laughs> and it's very cute. And so on every page, there are different kinds of moos. There's loud ones, soft ones, jiggly ones, whatever. But I think that this is a nice shorthand to explain what it is that I'm trying to do. We're trying to learn how to speak moo since cows can't speak to us in the way that we can understand, we need to make it easy for them to express what it is that they need. So what I'm gonna do now is explain to you some of the scientific frameworks that we use for studying animal welfare. So this diagram represents what's called Dr. David Fraser's three circles. So Dr. Fraser is my academic grandfather meaning he was my PhD advisor's PhD advisor. And he's a, a lovely human being and also absolutely inspirational. So he came up with this framework and there are other ways of thinking about animal welfare. But what I really like about this is that it captures that there are these different interests to consider when we're talking about animal welfare from a holistic perspective. So the circle at the top I've labeled health, but I think a more nuanced way to think about it is the animal's bodily functioning or physical or physiological functioning. So if this were a wild animal, we would be thinking about their fitness. Are they able to survive and reproduce? And when we're thinking about farmed animals, we might be examining aspects such as health. So does the cow um, have injuries? or does she lack injuries? Does she have some kind of disease state or is she healthy? How is her reproductive ability? How is her milk production? Or for a younger animal, what's her growth? And so all of these things are definitely important. I think it's very intuitive and obvious why. And there are decades of animal science and veterinary science research into understanding this aspect of animal welfare. But I think it's important to note that animal health and animal welfare are not synonymous. So no, I'm not a vet. Sometimes I wish I was. Um, there are lots of things that I can't answer because I don't have that kind of training. But what you can see is that good health is necessary for good welfare. It's a component of it, but it's not sufficient. We have to think about other aspects of the cow's quality of life to really understand her welfare. So what I'm gonna to point to then is this circle on the lower left corner that's blue. And so I've labeled this with a shorthand as the cow's feelings. And I think sometimes calling it that can get a little sticky depending on who you're talking to, but that's the shorthand. The scientific jargon is the cow's affective state. So this means her emotional state or subjective internal mental experience. And I think this is really key. And it's why we have the entire field of animal welfare. So what is the difference between farm animals and farmed plants when we talk about other aspects of agriculture? And it's that plants are not 
as far as we know right now, sentient. So there are people who study the biological functioning and health of plants. There are plant pathologists. It's very important. But we're not concerned that plants can suffer. But we are concerned that farmed animals can suffer. And so through decades of scientific research now, we have been validate that farmed animals, including dairy cows, are able to experience positive and negative affective states. So again, we're not trying to anthropomorphize. I think there's been really fascinating research on species such as primates or elephants, looking at these very nuanced emotional states that can seem very human-like. So you may have seen videos of monkeys who seem like they're jealous of other ones. That's not what I'm talking about here. So when we talk about dairy cattle, what we need to acknowledge is that there are very negative states that people might describe as suffering. So this can be pain, fear, stress, and these are things we want to avoid. But on the flip side, we know that they can experience positive emotions too. So this can be emotions such as comfort or contentment or reward, and that we want to promote the opportunity to experience these positive affective states. So of course, one of the things that can influence an animal's affective state is her health status or her biological functioning. If she's not feeling well physically, she might not be feeling well emotionally. But that's where this third part of the Venn diagram comes in, because we know that there are things other than just, I put that in quotes because obviously health is important, but there are things other than just an animal's health that can affect her subjective experience and her overall quality of life. And so as a shorthand, I've labeled this behavior. And I think it's better described as the ability for an animal to perform species-relevant natural behaviors or important natural behaviors. This doesn't mean all natural behaviors, but ones that lead to a positive affective state or minimize negative affective states. So what do I mean by that? There are natural behaviors that are not necessarily something that the animal wants. And for example, that could be being chased by a predator. <laughs> that is natural. A lot of animals have anti-predator responses. It doesn't mean that if in captivity they don't have a chance to express that, then they have a negative affective state. But on the flip side, there are certain behaviors that are relevant for a species that are important for them to perform. And if they don't get that opportunity, they can experience negative emotions such as frustration or stress. And so I'm calling this behavioral well-being, just as a reminder that it's not just physical health, but also this emotional health. OK, so now you've had Animal Welfare 101. We talked about Dr. Fraser's three circles. And again, the reason I like it is because I think it really captures this holistic idea of animal welfare to help us think through which aspects of welfare are certain management practice addressing. Are we providing an animal with good biological functioning and physical health, but missing out on opportunities to allow her to express important behaviors. And it helps remind us to think about these three different aspects. Many of you may have heard of a different framework. So how many people here have heard of the five freedoms? That's totally fine. So what you might have seen this if, say, you're somebody who uh, is already interested in animal welfare and you're concerned about where your food comes from, your favorite restaurant chain or grocery store may have an animal welfare statement on their website. And if they do, there's a very high chance that what they're going to show is that they believe in the five freedoms and expect their say, dairy suppliers to adhere to the five freedoms. So this is very historically important. And so the five freedoms are that the animal should be free of hunger and thirst. These are negative emotions, which is why I've color-coded them blue. Freedom from discomfort, again, a negative affective state. And then freedom from pain, injury, or disease. So pain is a negative emotional state. Inju injury and disease threaten the animal's biological functioning. And then freedom to express most natural behavior. Again, there's this caveat of most because not all natural behaviors are desirable or important. So you can see I've color-coded that in green. And then finally, the freedom from fear and distress. Again, negative emotions. And so you can see with the five freedoms, they are touching upon all three of Dr. Fraser's circles. Um, and you can see they're, they're also heavily weighted towards the animal's affective state. Because again, it comes down to what is the cow's quality of life? What is she experiencing subjectively? But I like Dr. Fraser's circles because you can see it's, it's color coded. It's very easy to organize your thoughts using the three circles. So coming back to this idea of how do we give cows a voice, I think it is easy to objectively measure things like biological, 
biological functioning. It is more difficult to measure these other aspects. So what is the animal's subjective mental state? What kinds of behaviors are important for her to perform? So what I'm gonna mainly talk about today is the green circle. How do we understand what a cow wants? And so what we can do is provide opportunities for them to tell us, and we can then measure and quantify either what it is that a cow prefers and what is important to them and how important is it. And by allowing them to express those things, we can gain some insights into their behavioral needs and improve their welfare by working opportunities into their environments for them to express those behaviors. So what I'm going to talk about now is these two major techniques that we often use in animal welfare science. So the first is called preference testing, and it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's a way to allow the animal to vote with their feet. And so there are different ways that we can evaluate preference in scientific studies. So some of them can be short-term and somewhat contrived. So we have a tool that we call the Y maze, and this can be very small in the case of a mouse or very large in the case of a cow, and it's exactly what it sounds like. So the animal starts at the stem of the Y, and then they're presented with two different choices. And then you can quantify which option they choose more frequently. And so the animal learns what the options are, and then they have repeated chances to make this choice, and then you can quantify, do they choose option A significantly more often than option B? And that would allow you to infer that they prefer option A. There is another way to conduct preference testing in what we call the animal's home environment. So again, for a mouse, this could be in their cage, or for a cow, it would be in the pen or the pasture in which they live. And so you can offer them different choices within their home environment, and over time you quantify how often they use a certain resource or how much time they spend using it compared to another one, say, of equal size. And so you account for chance. How much time could they happen to be observed in that area if they didn't actually care or have a preference? And then you can quantify, did they spend significantly more time there than would be ex expected by chance, and then infer their preference. So I think preference testing is very important. It's very common. It's a technique we use in our lab a lot. But there are some limitations. So preference testing tells you a ranked choice among the options that you present. So first, you have to make an educated guess. Are the options you're presenting even relevant? And all that you're inferring is the ranked choice. You know they choose option A more than option B, or they spend more time with option A more than option B. But what it doesn't tell you is the valence. So by valence, I mean, is it something positive, neutral, or negative, and sort of to what degree? And so what I'm showing here with these emoticons is the situations that can happen, but you can't actually discriminate between these with preference testing. So the first option, it could be that the, you've presented an animal with two choices that both have a positive valence. And so I'm call, call, calling this icing on the cake. So, it could be in our free ice cream example. <laughs> Maybe you're somebody who likes both the vanilla and also the orange custard with the chocolate chips, and you just happen to like the one with the chocolate chips more, so that's what you chose tonight. Or maybe you're somebody who took both. But in any case, it, that's just icing on the cake. You like both, but you're just gonna take the more preferred one. Or it could actually be that the animal is discriminating between opposite valences. So it could be that one option is something desirable, that is preferred, and the other option is actually something negative or aversive. And so they would choose option A because it's something positive, and they're avoiding option B because it's aversive. And the last scenario that I'm outlining here is what I'm calling the lesser of two evils. So maybe actually they don't like either option, but they don't have a choice, and they can't avoid both. So say in a Y maze test, they have to go and pick one or the other within an allotted time. And so they're just choosing the lesser of the two evils or the one that's less aversive. So the problem with preference testing is you cannot distinguish between which of these three scenarios is going on in terms of uh, what's happening internally for the animal. Why are they making the choice that they're making? And so this is where just a preference test alone isn't enough. I think it's a really excellent starting point and it's a very powerful tool, but then other research is needed to understand why is the animal choosing that? Is it something that they find desirable that they're actually motivated to obtain or are they trying to avoid something? So there are other techniques that can complement preference testing and I'm just going to talk about one of those today. 
and that's called motivation testing. And so this draws inspiration from consumer literature. So when we look at human economics, we can make some analogies that have informed some of the interesting techniques that we've applied to animals. So if this was a test with human subjects, you might play an economic game where they give you real money or fake money and ask you how much would you pay for a certain thing. And the more you're willing to pay, the more important we would infer it is to you. So if you're willing to pay more, it's more desirable. And we can translate this into a language that animals can understand. So in the case of certain animals, for example, dairy cattle, you can ask them to push weights. So you can put weights on a gate and you increase the amount of weight and so they have to exert more physical effort to obtain a certain resource. So now they're paying an increasing price. Another classic example is asking an animal to push a button or a lever repeatedly. So I think people have heard about this with lab rats or lab mice. And we've done the same thing. We've trained dairy calves to push a button repeatedly. And so you increase the price by asking them to push that same button more and more to obtain the same resource. And another way is to ask an animal to navigate obstacles. So literally you can put a moat <laughs> or you can put something they have to climb over. So there are other ways to impose this price. So the logic is that if a resource or opportunity to perform a certain behavior is important to an animal, then they'll be motivated to gain access to that resource or to perform that behavior. And so if they're motivated, they should then be willing to work harder to gain access to that resource or to the opportunity to perform that behavior. And so they would continue to pay that price even as the price increases. So the way we graph this out is what's called consumer elasticity of demand. So again, it draws from these economic theories and applies it to animal behavior. So what you're seeing on the x-axis is increasing price. So as you go to the right, you're requiring people to pay more money or push heavier weights, press the lever more times, et cetera. And then on the y-axis, again, it's unitless, but it's increasing or decreasing willingness to pay a certain price. And so the line that I have here right now is illustrating what's called inelastic demand. And we can classify things as essentials if you see this pattern of relatively inelastic demand. So that line doesn't have to be flat, but it's relatively flat. So you see that as the price increases, the demand doesn't decrease that much. And so the example I've put here is an egg because it's something that I think many of us have experienced recently. So as a result of the avian flu, egg prices went through the roof and we went from paying less than $2 a dozen to like $12 a dozen at one point. And my family continued to buy eggs. We just maybe ate fewer at a time and, and stretched it out a little bit further. So our demand for eggs was relatively inelastic. We saw this as an essential or staple in our household. But, um, yeah, so, so as an example for how you would evaluate this in dairy cattle, we have what we call a referent, so th something that we know is really inelastic for them. So in the case of dairy cattle, we know that they're highly motivated to gain access to fresh feed when they're hungry. It seems intuitive. But this is something that we can impose in a testing scenario. So we can, say, deprive them of feed for two hours so that they get a bit hungry, and then we know that they'll be willing to pay this price. So even as the price of gaining access to feed increases, we know that they'll pay that price because they're hungry, and so they'll do the work to obtain access to fresh feed. Okay, but shifting to a different example line now, this blue line, I'm contrasting this with the one I showed you for inelastic demand. So this is illustrating the concept of elastic demand. So you can see that as the price increases, now the willingness to pay goes down much more steeply. And so you could consider something to be more of a luxury, less of an essential, if you see this steep decrease in demand as the price increases. So the analogy I've put here for me would be concert tickets. So back in the day, I used to go to a lot of rock concerts. It's something I enjoy a lot. But nowadays, not only has the price gone up, but also the fees on top of those. And so for me, I've decided to go without. I don't go as frequently anymore. I'm not willing to pay that price, even though it's something I enjoy. So what I'm gonna do now is walk you through an example of how motivation testing can be applied to understanding what's important to dairy cattle specifically. So sometimes 
dairy cattle are housed in environments that lack some opportunities to perform certain natural behaviors. And when that happens, if an animal has a highly motivated natural behavior that it would normally desire to perform, and it's unable to do so, she can experience negative affective states. So this can be boredom or frustration. And this can result in the animal performing abnormal behaviors. Ab, sorry, abnormal behaviors. And that's something undesirable. It's an indicator of possible negative welfare. So as an example of a natural behavior that cattle are highly motivated to perform, um, we can talk about grooming. So there is a way to give cattle opportunities to perform this natural behavior indoors. So if you house cows outdoors, they will often rub against fence posts or trees or other objects to groom themselves. And when they're indoors, this can translate into them rubbing on objects in the pen that's maybe not so desirable. And so a lot of dairy farms do provide these rotating mechanical brushes. And these aren't just repurposed from car washes, although they can be. These are actually custom built for dairy cows. And there's many different manufacturers on the market now that market these for dairy cows. And the reason is several fold. So first, there is a benefit for the cow's biological functioning. So by grooming themselves, they can remove ectoparasites, they can remove dead hair. It's something that improves hygiene and cleanliness. So a lot of dairy farmers were originally drawn to this idea for milk quality purposes. So they want to have clean cows and good hygiene on the farm. But it's also something that research has shown is important for their welfare in terms of addressing this desire to perform a highly motivated behavior. So this is a photo taken at the University of British Columbia's research dairy where I did my postdoc. I'm not the one who did the study, so I'm just giving you an example of one of the studies that they did. But they used motivation testing to try to quantify how important is it for cows to have access to a brush. And so the graph I'm showing you here should look somewhat familiar. It's an example of this consumer elasticity of demand. Um, it's also called a survival curve. And so what you're reading is it's sort of an inverse, but on the x-axis, it's the amount of weight attached to a pulley system that was attached to a gate. So the units there really aren't important. What's important to know is that they increase the amount of effort that it took for the cows to put, push open that gate. And then on the y-axis, what you can see is the proportion of cows that were willing to push. So in the beginning, when there was no weight on the gate, you can see it's at 100%. And then as the amount of weight increases, then fewer cows are willing to push. And so they had three treatments in this experiment. One was an empty pen as a control. So cows had to push this weighted gate and they just got access to a pen with nothing in it. And they could see before they entered that there was nothing in it. But they wanted to just compare our cows pushing just for kicks. And then they had this positive control treatment. So that was what I mentioned earlier. It's something that we know is in access to fresh feed after two hours of feed deprivation. And then the third treatment was that rotating mechanical brush that you saw in the photo. So what the graph is showing you is that this black line here is the empty space. So you can see demand dropped off quickly as the price increased. And then these other two lines, so um, they actually had two different chances to access the brush. So that's the yellow and the red. And then the blue is the fresh feed. So you can see those curves are pretty much neck and neck. So the cows were more willing to continue to push as the price increased compared to accessing an empty pen, but they were equally motivated to access fresh feed when they were hungry as they were to access the brush. So just to sort of visually summarize that, I'm putting up this cur the curves that I showed you earlier just as examples. And so you can see the demand was not perfectly inelastic when it came to the brush or the fresh feed, but it was much more elastic for the empty pen than it was for these other two resources. So what they inferred from this study is that cows do care a whole lot about access to this brush. They care just as much as they do to access fresh feed when they're hungry, which is the gold standard they were comparing against. So I think that this is a really great example of how we can ask cows questions about what is important to you and how important is it. I want to shift to talking about a little bit of the work that we've done in my lab. So we've looked at other age classes as well. So what I'm showing here is a picture of some heifers. So these are future milking cows, and they've already been weaned off of milk, and now in their, they're in the growth phase, but they're not producing lactating cows yet. 
And we wanted to look at ways to give this age group access to brushes in a simpler, maybe more affordable fashion, because these large, fancy, rotating brushes cost thousands of dollars. It's a big investment, and a lot of dairy farmers do invest in their cows and provide them, but we wanted to see if there was a practical, lower barrier option for them to enhance their animal care without this huge financial burden. So we went to the hardware store, and we bought some deck scrub brushes, and we mounted them on the walls, and we wanted to see how these weaned heifers would respond. So one of the things we looked at was how quickly did they approach them, because Dairy cattle are by nature very curious, but they are also sometimes a bit fearful of novelty. It's called neophobia. They have reason to be skeptical because they are prey animals. And so sometimes when you put a new object into a pen, they will avoid it. They'll stare, but they'll kind of avoid because they aren't sure if it's a threat. But what we found was that for these heifers, they had never seen a brush like this in their lives. But on average, it took them less than four minutes to start using them. And some heifers started using them within eight seconds. So it was something that they were just drawn to, and they started using them right away. And what I'm not showing on this slide is that we also had an element of a preference test. And so we had mounted these brushes in different orientations, either vertically or horizontally. We had bristles of different stiffnesses because some manufacturers market softer bristles for calves, softer and gentler. We wanted to know, do the calves actually care? And what we found was no preference. But in this case, we actually thought that the lack of preference was informative because it meant that dairy producers have flexibility in how they provide this resource to the calves. So it, our message was, it actually doesn't matter which direction you mount it, it doesn't matter what kind of bristles you buy, they will use them. And so in this case, the lack of preference was actually useful information. And another thing that we found was that this younger age group used these brushes in different ways. So with the rotating brushes, cows are primarily using them for grooming. But with these simpler brushes that don't rotate, what we found was that the younger animals were in fact grooming themselves as expected, but they were also doing a lot of what we called oral manipulation. So they were licking the brushes, chewing them, and exploring them with their mouths. And we thought that that was really interesting. And that potentially it meant that this same resource could provide opportunities for them to ex perform different types of natural behaviors. So we haven't explicitly looked at motivation for this specific type of brush, and no studies have compared cows' preferences between the two types. But we thought that this was interesting, and it showed that they could have multiple benefits. And sorry, on this slide it does talk about the lack of preference. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about a different example of another topic that we look at in my lab. And this is a topic I began exploring during my PhD in California. And this is alleviating heat stress. And so today, with it being almost 90 degrees, I think it is the perfect time to talk about it, especially in the comfort of an air-conditioned room with free ice cream. So with thermal stress, it's something that we know affects the animal's biological functioning. There are enormous economic impacts because when cows are heat stressed, they produce less milk. It's an adaptive mechanism because milk production takes an enormous amount of energy, so they produce a lot of metabolic body heat as a side effect. So when cows are heat stressed, they produce less milk, and that's protective to them because now they produce less body heat. It's a way for them to alleviate that heat stress naturally. But again, that's bad news economically. And we also know that it can affect their welfare in other ways. So cows respond to thermal stress with this subjective feeling of discomfort, and they tell us this through their behavior, and this can disrupt their normal behaviors. And so if we're thinking about these different circles of welfare, heat stress is a serious concern in terms of the animal's welfare from all of these different perspectives. So I'm showing this graph that's updated through the end of 2022, and what it's showing, I'm sorry, it's a bit small, um, but the, the redder colors mean that the temperatures were warmer compared to what's expected, and the cooler colors indicate that the temperatures were cooler. So what you can see is there's a lot of red, so the most intense red means that that's the record warmest ever recorded. And so what, it, what it, this information is showing on average is that 2022 was the sixth 
warmest year among all the years on record since 1880. And so we've had this happen where now it's not just a one-off, it's become a pattern. And so from a dairy cattle welfare perspective, we are increasingly concerned about the burden that heat stress is placing on our cows, and we have every reason to expect that it's going to be a continued, if not increasing, welfare concern in the future. So this is going to sound like a digression, but it's not. People often ask when they find out that I'm an animal welfare scientist who works on dairy cattle, they want to know if it's better to house cows outdoors on pasture or inside in a barn. And the answer is both, actually. So when you give cows a voice and you ask them what they prefer, cows choose to be in both environments. So from the cow's perspective, it's not that they always want to be on pasture or always want to be in a barn or never want to be in a barn or never want to be on pasture. It's context dependent. And so that's one of the messages of this next graph I'm showing you. So these are two studies that were done in Canada, not by me, but at the University of British Columbia. So the climate is not terribly different from here. You know, it's moderated a little bit because it's sort of close to the coast. But they do have the extremes in our temperate climate. So they have snowy winters. They have relatively warm summers, maybe not even as warm as here. But what you're seeing is on the x-axis, we have a temperature humidity index. So it's an index that combines air temperature, dry bulb temperature, and relative humidity. So the higher the temperature humidity index value, the hotter it feels. And so you can have a relatively cooler temperature with high relative humidity that feels hotter than a high air temperature with a lower humidity. So it accounts for that. And on the y-axis, what you're seeing is the percentage of time that cows were spending on pasture. So they were housed in a barn, and the doors were open. So they had free choice for how much time they wanted to spend inside the barn and outside on a connected pasture. And so what you can see is that cows were never spending 100% of their time outside or inside. And this was just during daylight hours in both studies. And the second thing that you should see is there was this linear negative linear relationship. So the hotter it was outside, the less time cows spent outside on pasture. And so what this is illustrating is that their use of those environments was context dependent. So what we think was happening was that the cows were staying inside during the peak heat of the day because the barn provided shade, which is something that we know is very important to cows. What these graphs aren't showing you, but these studies included, is patterns over time of day. So cows actually spent the vast majority of their time outside on pasture at night. And interestingly, they weren't grazing. So they were provided um, a total, what's called a total mix ration. So they had all the nutrients they needed indoors if they chose to eat indoors. But they went outside at night to lie down. But during the day, they were primarily inside, especially as it grew hotter. And so when we're talking about thermal stress, I think this is really important to understand that cows can tell us what they need. And so this is why we shouldn't anthropomorphize. So yesterday, it was 87 degrees outside. I was at the Memorial Union Terrace, and I saw undergraduates sunbathing. <laughs> and I am not heat tolerant. I wanted to sit in the shade. And so I think for a lot of people, they would think, you know, cows want to be outside on pasture. They want to feel the sun on their backs, because that's what I like. I want to be out sunbathing. And that's absolutely not the case for your average dairy cow. They are what I call metabolic athletes. It takes a lot of physiological work to produce that amount of milk. So they start to feel hot at a lower threshold than we as humans do. And so again, this is why it's so important to give cows a voice. So we know that cows are highly motivated for shade. So the study I'm going to talk about was done by a collaborator in New Zealand. And what they did was they set up a trade-off. And so instead of having cows push weights, because physical exertion generates body heat, they had to find a different way for cows to pay a price. So we know that for dairy cows, they need to spend approximately half of their day or more lying down. It's how they rest. So unlike horses who sleep standing up, cows actually do need to spend a great deal of time lying down. That's when they do a lot of their ruminating and chewing their cud and digesting. So in this study, what they did was they built a structure on the ground. It was kind of a grid. So it was uncomfortable for cows to lie down. So they essentially were forced to stand up for 12 hours straight. And then they gave the cows a choice. So now they could go lie down, but that area was still in the sun. Or they could continue standing up and do so in the shade. And what these cows chose to do was to keep standing, even though they were fatigued and they 
need to spend at least half their day lying down, they chose to keep standing up because that's how important the shade was to them. And this same research group in New Zealand, um, and I should say that they house their cows on pasture. So this is where this question of shade access is so important because they're not typically housed inside of a barn. So in a different study, they used preference testing. So again, these techniques can complement each other. And in this study, they set up a Y maze. And the cows were exposed repeatedly to three different options so they could understand what they were choosing. But then they were offered the choice between only two options at a time so that they could rank order these preferences. And so the three different choices were a shade structure, no shade, so just ambient conditions and direct sunlight, and then sprinklers that would shower the cows with water, which would help them cool down. But these showers were not shaded. And so they also measured the cows' thermoregulatory responses. And they found that when the cows were unshaded, they accumulated heat. So their thermoregulatory responses showed that they became even hotter over time. When they were shaded, it kept them from gaining heat from solar radiation. But when they were soaked with water, they actually actively cooled down. So the water soakers were the most effective when you looked at the biological functioning perspective. But that's not what the cows chose. And that shows, again, how important shade is. So when they were comparing the choice between the shade and the sprinklers without shade, cows chose the shade significantly more often. And of course, they chose the shade more than the direct sunlight. So when you ask the cow, she didn't necessarily choose the most effective option, but I think the option that made more sense from an evolutionary perspective. So we do see cows in naturalistic settings that will wade, but when we observe their behavior in rainy conditions, they often show this kind of avoidance behavior. And so even though it's more effective, it's kind of hard to get them out of that sort of um, evolutionary context. So shade is something that's so relevant to them. It's something that they seek out. We have to make sure to provide it. And so the take home message here is to avoid trade offs between important resources. So we know that water soakers are effective, but shade is also effective and it's something very relevant to the cows. So when I conducted my PhD in California, I took that idea and I then gave cows a choice between eating under an area that had just shade or an area that was also shaded but now had water soakers. And in that case, the cows did prefer the combination of the shade and the sprinklers. So it's not that they don't know what's good for them, it's just when you force them to choose, they will choose shade. And so what this graph is showing is, I just have 24 hour air temperature in degrees Celsius, so not the temperature humidity index, because in this environment, the relative humidity was so low that it didn't make any difference. And then what you're seeing here on the y-axis is the percent of time they spent in the option that had the combination of shade and sprinklers. And then there's a dash line here at 50%. So what you can see is that when these resources were combined, the cows were spending the majority of their time under the shade with the sprinklers and not just the shade alone. So as long as you combine the resources, the cows do prefer that. And that magnitude of preference increased in warmer weather. So when I moved here to Wisconsin, and I was talking with Wisconsin dairy farmers about their concerns around animal welfare, a lot of them did bring up heat stress. They know that even in this continental climate, where we have long, cold winters, that heat stress is still a concern in the summer. And although some farms in this region do use water soakers, um, a lot of times they had questions about ventilation. So this is something I didn't work with in California. There the barns tend to be open-sided. It's a different climate. It's a different system. But it, it got me thinking about how to address some of these concerns. So going back to my very first slide showing me inside one of these Wisconsin dairy barns, I got a lot of questions about, well, how exactly are we supposed to calibrate our fans? So it's very common that dairy producers have fans installed, but just the presence of a resource doesn't mean that it's effective. So my analogy is if you walk into somebody's home and you see that they have a treadmill, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're physically fit. They could be using it as a clothes drying rack. And so you actually have to measure some outcomes to know if that resource is delivering the intended effect. And so that is what we did here when we were evaluating the use of fans or other mechanical ventilation systems in dairy barns in Wisconsin. So what we did here was we calibrated the fans to deliver a specific airspeed as measured at the cow's resting height. Because there can be a lot of problems with the fan installation, where even if you have a very powerful device, if it's not aimed correctly, it's not going to reach the cows and deliver this intended effect. 
And so it sounds really obvious, but this was the first study that looked at calibrating the airspeeds at the cow's resting height to provide this fast moving air where they need to spend at least 12 hours a day lying down. So previous heat stress research had found that methods such as fans or water soakers could do things like improve milk production during periods of heat stress, which is really important and that's a component of welfare, but no previous work, including my own in California, had ever been able to find a way to encourage cows to spend enough time lying down in heat stress. So instead you would see this characteristic negative linear response where as the temperatures got hotter or temperature humidity index got higher, cows would spend less time lying down. And we know this is problematic from a welfare perspective because Cows want to spend half the day lying down, but they were standing up to dissipate heat and compensate, even when they had these very effective water soakers. And we think it's because, again, if we think about their evolutionary history, they're responding to certain cues in their environment. And so when they're getting sprayed with water soakers, that's not where they're lying down, because you don't want to make the bedding wet. That's the milk quality issue. So instead, we thought they might respond behaviorally to this fast moving air over their backs if we target these fans correctly. And so that's indeed what we found, but instead of showing you graphs, I think in this case a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is just a snapshot in time, but these two pictures were taken one minute apart at about 2 p.m. on a very hot day. And so what you can see in the top picture is an example of our control treatment. So in this case, the fans were turned off, and it was just the prevailing, prevailing winds coming through the barn. And only five out of the 16 cows in this pen were lying down and resting in their stalls. And all of the rest were bunched around the water troughs, which is a natural behavioral response during times of heat stress. But in the bottom photo, you can see in one of our fan treatments, we had calibrated these fans to deliver high speed air, so 2.4 meters per second at the height of a cow lying down. And there, 14 out of the 16 cows were resting in the stalls and the other two were eating. And that's normally a behavioral response that's suppressed in times of heat stress. So they eat less so that they produce less heat while digesting. And so this, I think, is really emblematic of the quantitative results we found in this study. But heat stress doesn't just affect adult lactating cows. So adult cows are quite vulnerable to heat stress because they're producing milk and producing so much metabolic heat. But we also need to think about the younger age classes as well. And so what I'm showing here is a common housing system for young pre wean calves in our region. So they often are housed outdoors. And the reason for that is that it provides really good ventilation. So even though we have harsh winters, we often find good health outcomes when calves are housed in what's called these outdoor hutches because of this natural air exchange. What I'm illustrating here is a housing system that we used in our research setup, and I'm just calling it a calf duplex as a shorthand because it um, illustrates the fact that these cows, calves had a social companion. So these two hutches were placed side by side and they were connected by an outdoor fenced area. So the calves had two of these plastic igloos and then also this outdoor area that they could share. So they could choose to be together inside one of the hutches they could choose to be separate if they needed some alone time or they could be outside together. And so this study was done by my PhD student, Dr. Kim Reuscher, who successfully defended her PhD yesterday. And she came from Texas where heat stress is always top of mind. And she had this passion for trying to better understand heat stress in dairy calves. And so she made this beautiful illustration here of how calves can gain heat from their environment so with these plastic igloos, depending on the design, sometimes when the calf is inside, even though she's shaded from direct solar radiation, there can sometimes be this unfortunate greenhouse effect. That's not the case actually with the ones that are research dairy. They do provide shade and kind of hold that inter internal microclimate stable. But once the calf is inside, now she's generating body heat and that can cause the temperature inside the hutch to also increase. But this is something nobody had actually quantified before. And now in this calf duplex setup, calves have the animal welfare benefit of social companionship, but if they try to be inside the same hutch at the same time, now you have the heat of two bodies, perhaps exacerbating the experience of heat stress inside that environment. And so what Dr. Reuscher did was she 
gave calves a preference test. And so they were housed with these two connected hutches, but one of them had additional passive ventilation. And so that's what you're seeing on the left. So the, this rear door here is actually so that the farmer can add additional bedding, but we had that propped open and then um, secured with a cable tie so the calves couldn't escape <laughs> because we did have some that were escape artists. And then there were these additional portholes on the bottom that can be closed in the winter. So we don't want that icy cold winter um, air coming in, but in the summer you can open and provide this additional passive ventilation. And then the other hutch was not ventilated on the back, but what you see in this picture is there is an opening on the front for calves to come in and out. It's not completely sealed up. And each pair of calves had one hutch of each type, but the side was balanced. So it's not that the ventilated was always on the left and the non-ventilated was always on the right. That was balanced between the pairs. And so what I'm not going to show you, but I'll just tell you, is that this passive ventilation did manage to make that environment cooler. So even without calves inside, the air temperature was cooler inside just from better air exchange. And it also affected the calves' thermoregulatory responses. So we had a phase of the study where we standardized how much time the calves spent inside each type of hutch, whether by herself or with her social companion. And we did find that this passive ventilation mitigated their biological functioning, their physiological signs of heat stress. But what we're talking about today is giving the calves a voice. And so we also evaluated their preference for these different hutch types. So we did this at three different life stages. So this is their weeks of life. So four weeks old, six weeks old, or nine weeks old. And we looked at this for three day periods within each of these weeks. And so with the reason we chose these time periods is because they represent milestones in the calves development. So at four weeks of age, they're still drinking a lot of milk. They're on their peak milk allowance. But then by week six, they're beginning weaning. So they're tapering off milk and eating more solids. And then by nine weeks old, they're completely off of milk and they're only eating solids. And at the same time, they're getting bigger and their rumen is developing and they're starting to produce more body heat. So what you can see is that when they were four weeks old, there's this dashed line here indicating 50%, which would represent chance or no preference between the two hutch types. And indeed, when they were at that age, they spent about equal time in both the non-ventilated and the passively ventilated hutch. But then by the time they were six weeks old, and again, when they were nine weeks old, they developed a significant preference for, for spending time in the ventilated hutch. And they were often found there together. So even though we found that when two calves were inside the same hutch, that did increase the heat load on the calves, the ventilation could mitigate that, and that's what the calves preferred. And so the calves were able to tell us that they were attracted to this environment that provided a more thermally comfortable place for them to spend time. So just to wrap this up, the take home message is that I think it really is important to give cows or calves or whatever species a chance to tell us what they prefer and what's important to them. Because by giving them a voice and learning this information, we can gain insight into what they need. So what behaviors are important for them to perform, um, what resources are important for them to gain access to, so that we can improve their welfare from this holistic perspective. So of course it's important to think about their health and their biological functioning, but when we're looking at welfare holistically and we're thinking about their subjective quality of life, what are they experiencing, then we need to also consider this ability to perform these important behaviors. So I know that we'll have a bit of time for questions, but if anybody thinks of any some other time, I, also, I always welcome you to reach out. Email is generally the best way to reach me since I'm not always by my phone. And so you can email me at jvanoss at wisc.edu. And then I have a shortcut for my um, website. So if you've seen one that has cals.wisc.edu, it takes you to the exact same place. Um, and so we have some resources there, some videos, some fact sheets, and I always welcome you to reach out. So thank you very much. Questions. Um, while I'm coming over, I'll ask one. What differences do you see between breeds, if any significant differences? So, okay, so you do have a mic. Yeah, so the question is about breed differences. And so I will say that in my work on dairy cattle, the work that I have done has been on Holstein. So there's two reasons for that. And one is they are the most common dairy breed in the U.S. They represent maybe 90% or so of 
all dairy cows in the U.S., although the popularity of jerseys is growing. And jerseys have produced milk that has a higher butter fat content, and they're also smaller, so they eat a little bit less, so some people see them as a more sustainable alternative. They're also really cute, but there are some behavioral differences. So jer jerseys are more prone to showing what's called abnormal oral behavior. So when I showed you the photo of the heifers using the brush, Jersey heifers are more prone to showing abnormal what's called tongue rolling. So they'll stick their tongues out and then kind of go like this, or they'll chew on objects in their environment. So we did not evaluate that in jerseys. But I think that that would be an interesting question to know, are there strategies that we can use to mitigate these abnormal behaviors? So I've never done a direct breed comparison. I think it is important to look at Holsteins because I want my information to be as broadly applicable as possible. But there are others who have looked at other breeds. So I wonder if you found any other unintentional prompting other than left and right preferences. Um, so are you talking about the study with the... the about any like study it? where you unintentionally prompt a cow to make a decision that you were unaware of, and it looks like you, you thought of that with the left and right. I wonder if you thought of that in other cases and found that you were unintentionally prompting the cows. Uh, yeah, so, so, you know, in these controlled experiments, we do our best to try to control for known variability, but there are often surprises. And so in these y maze tests, likewise, we balance where the choices are offered. So I didn't show some of the y maze tests I've done, but in New Zealand, they, they balanced where the water sprinkler was versus the shade versus the, the sun for the different cows. And so in my PhD work, I also had built a y maze for some cows looking at their preference for water sprinklers. And what I learned is that plywood is very attractive to cows. And so oftentimes they will pause and they'll lick plywood. I'm not sure what they're tasting there or the reason that they're doing that. And so um, sometimes you'll find that the construction materials you use have these unintended side effects. And so I don't think that that affected our results scientifically. It was just sort of a learning experience for how we would construct some of those contraptions going forward. And if I think of other funny anecdotes, I'll let you know. Oh, actually, so there is another one, which is um, we learned from another research group. So I am no longer active on social media, but I know on Twitter for a while people were using a hashtag about overly honest methods. So people vary in how much detail they report in the materials and methods section of their papers. But we were very grateful because another research group, and I actually believe they were testing Jersey calves, said that for their calves, they had put their devices inside of a suet cage. So if you're feeding birds in your backyard, it's often this green metal kind of mesh contraption, you put the suet cake in. And we thought that was brilliant because calves do have a lot of this oral manipulation behavior. So when we were logging the temperature and relative humidity inside of these calf hutches, we put our devices inside of suet cages to protect them from the calves. So we were very, very grateful that another research group was able to prevent us from having this unanticipated finding. <laughs> I think that your hand was up first. Yeah, I'll do Dareth first here. The calves uh, in paired hutches, has that been replicated elsewhere and in other climatic conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. So we were not the first ones who had that idea. And there were a couple of papers from Canada that had used that kind of method with the duplex hutches. And there were a couple from Ohio. And now I'm seeing some producers use that in, in this region, so sort of Midwest, places with continental climate, so Midwest or Northeast or Canada where these plastic hutches are common. And the reason I recommend it actually is not because I think it's ideal, it's because I think it's pragmatic. So for producers who are trying to shift away from individual housing of their calves towards pair or group housing, it's a way for them to use their existing infrastructure without having to make a heavy financial investment such as building a calf barn when they didn't have one before. So it's a way for them to tiptoe in and see how it works for them. But one of the downsides is that it has these two separate indoor spaces and one outdoor space, so it's kind of complex. Whereas some farmers already have a calf barn, and if they have individual pens, they can remove a divider. So it's just a larger rectangle. So it's the same square footage or square meters per calf, but now it's just a connected environment. The problem with the environment that I showed is that calves do strongly prefer to be together in the same hutch. And in that case, they don't 
have the same square footage per calf that they did before. So now two are squeezing into there, and as they're growing, it becomes more and more challenging. So what I didn't show is Dr. Royster actually had a winter version of the study because she hypothesized maybe that's the bad thing in summer because two calves in one hutch makes them hotter, but in the winter that could have protective effects. And so our results there weren't as clean, but we did find some preliminary evidence, but ours was the first study to look at those outcomes, so I think more research is needed. In other climates, Producers have taken different approaches. There actually are a lot of different options for pair or group housing calves, and that's a message that I often talk to the dairy industry about is, it's not cookie cutter, it's not one size fits all, there are a lot of options, and now calf housing manufacturers have caught on and they're offering options for pair or group housing. So I saw a photo recently, it was from a calf ranch, I think in New Mexico, where the climate is quite different, but they understand how important shade is. And so they've constructed their pair housing entirely out of wire mesh. So the sides are four sides just wire mesh, but then there is a shade on top. So the calves have protection from direct sunlight, but there's no greenhouse effect and there's a lot of natural airflow. So it really depends on how much capital a producer has to invest in their housing, what kinds of modifications they're willing to make. But I would say this duplex igloo system is kind of regional. This might be a myth question. I've always wondered. Um, so does classical music actually help cows produce more milk? Because I know the USSR and communists tried to do that, but I'm not sure if they were very really successful. I'm not 100% certain of the answer about the effect of music on cows. Actually, I have a... So do you have the answer, or were you going to ask something else? Oh, no, no, no. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure. There are some studies looking at the effect of noise on cows. So, so certain kinds of noises, loud noises, can cause stress. So in terms of classical music, I'm not sure. I was very delighted to see a paper a few years ago out of UW-Madison looking at custom music for cats. So it was a collaboration between some kind of cat specialist and somebody in the music department where they were thinking about the evolutionary history of the cat's vocalizations and instead of classical music for humans, could you adapt the sounds to something that the, the cats would like? And I don't remember exactly what they found, but for cows, I don't have a direct answer to the effect of classical music on the cows. It's an interesting one. I have a good friend that owns a, a fabric duck company. Okay. And um, he said in the last, you know, number of years, he's, his uh, production of fabric ducks has really increased with dairy farmers, or farmers with cows, I presume it's dairy, dairy cows. But it's, uh, and um, it just brings fresh air. It's a long fabric duck right, that blows open right. with holes all the way down, and it brings cool air right where they yes, are without yeah. blasting them like with a fan. Yeah, so that's positive pressure tubes, exactly. So yeah. that, that actually came out of our vet school here at UW-Madison. So Dr. Ken Nordland, who's now retired, he's a professor emeritus, and amazing, amazing person, captivating speaker, and also this very sneaky sense of humor. Um, but yes, that, that is something that has come into play, not just for reducing heat stress, but also providing better ventilation in calf barns to make sure that we're keeping respiratory pathogens out. But yeah, absolutely, that's something that I learned when I came here because I hadn't seen that in other regions before. Yeah, positive, pa positive pressure tubes, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's the status of companion animals for improving welfare of dairy cattle? So you mean like instead of housing calves together, giving them some other species? Having, yeah, mixed species, um, whether it's something from long ago or I don't know if people are doing it now. No, I, I really appreciate that question actually because I'm not aware of any papers that have directly evaluated it, but I think in the future, um, if this trend for pair housing continues, so actually not in the US, but in other places of the world, it's starting to become required. So in the EU, there are certain places where calves have to be housed in pairs or groups after a certain age. Um, and actually in Canada, it's part of what's called the Canadian Code of Practice, that there is going to be an expectation. It's not explicitly required in the US, although at least a quarter of farms are already doing this, and there's been a lot of discussion in the past few years, which is why it became an area of my own research and extension. This is something that Wisconsin dairy farmers asked for, but it can be a challenge for smaller farms. So on large farms, many calves are born per week or per day, and so it's easy to pair calves together who are the same age. And this is really important because 
neonatal calves don't have a developed immune system yet. And so if you have older calves that are bringing pathogens to younger calves, that's a huge health risk. And so they need to be close in age. But for a very small dairy farm, they often don't have heifer calves born close in age. So even if they have a desire to house calves in pairs, it's not practical. It can be very risky. And so we have had this discussion in the industry, what are creative strategies for small dairies to be able to give their calves proper social companionship. And so people have asked me, can I give my calf a goat or, or something? And, and I don't have scientific evidence to support that, but I think that's an interesting idea, interesting hypothesis. There would be some concerns potentially about you know, transmission of certain diseases between species, but it's something that could be tested. Other questions? There you go. I'm curious. Uh, why did you transition from an undergraduate psychology major to dairy science? Yeah, thanks for the question. So what wasn't in the bio was the long and winding path in between. So I was an undergraduate psychology major, and I had these amazing opportunities to do undergraduate research. So I did a senior's honor, senior honors thesis. It was later published. And my advisor was a neurologist at a hospital who worked with Alzheimer's patients. And then I was co-advised by a professor in the psychology department. And at the time, I was very idealistic, and I thought, I'm going to do this amazing work to cure Alzheimer's. And it wasn't even close. I learned a ton. Um, but my topic that I chose, they gave me a lot of independence, was metacognition, <laughs> which is as esoteric as it sounds. So what I was curious about was, as patients develop Alzheimer's disease, how aware are they of the disease process? And how does that affect their memory performance, but also other aspects of their psychology? You know, if you're aware that you have this disease, how does that interact with the, your memory performance? And it was totally fascinating. I learned a lot about the scientific process, but I also learned about myself as a scientist. So I mentioned at the beginning that I really consider myself an applied scientist, and that's how I know I'm in the right place, because the work I do every day is exactly what I wanted to do back then, but what I was doing was just too esoteric for me. I think it was really, really fascinating, but that's not what keeps me going, and I wanted to do something more applied. I'm also the child of two academics, which you might have slightly been able to infer from my biography. My parents were geology professors at University of Illinois, which is why we lived there. Um, so I knew that you shouldn't undertake graduate school lightly. You should be really serious and passionate about what you're doing because if you don't, you're going to cry a lot. I mean, if you do love what you do, you still might. And so I took six years off, and I moved to Los Angeles, and I worked in industry. I worked in the business world, so completely unrelated to science, completely unrelated to agriculture. So growing up in Champaign-Urbana, I had some exposure to ag. I, you know, I, I didn't come from a farm. But it was just being a consumer. So in my 20s, as a young professional, starting to make my own purchasing decisions, I started to learn about this concept of sustainable agriculture, and I think animal welfare is a subset of that. So to be socially sustainable, we do need to care about how these animals are raised. And so it was kind of luck. So after six years working in business, I had gained some soft, sil soft skills, but I started to think, you know, how could I put my background in science towards a different topic. And so it was kind of luck that I started looking into different graduate programs. And Dr. Cassandra Tucker at UC Davis said she would take me on. I had to take a ton of prerequisites, essentially a second bachelor's, while I was doing my PhD because I didn't have a master's. Um, but it was wonderful working with dairy cows for the first time. I would have worked on chickens, actually. I spoke with another professor who studied poultry welfare. I just wanted to make a difference. And I felt so fortunate to work with dairy cows because I didn't know that they are so curious. They're really fun to work with. People have this mental image that cows are docile, maybe kind of dumb. They're not. They're wicked smart and really curious and can cause all sorts of problems with your studies, but it makes them really, really fun to work with. So I consider it just all the pieces falling into place, but it was, not, it was never a direct path. And so it's really an honor and a privilege to be here in Wisconsin now working on dairy cattle welfare. I couldn't ask for a better job. Raj Online asks, did you check the health of the cows in a standardized fashion before administering the tests? 
Um, so, it, depending on the study, so when it came to our adult lactating cows, we did have some enrollment criteria. So yes, we, we relied on the judgment of the farm staff and the herd veterinarian, and so we excluded cows who have lameness, which is a gait abnormality or difficulty walking, which reflects some kind of pain or discomfort in their ambulatory apparatus, because we are looking at lying and standing behavior, so if they're lame, that's going to affect that behavior. Um, for the calf studies we did, so my students and also the herd staff would check the calves' health status systematically every single day. So again, through our wonderful vet school here at University of Wisconsin, they've developed a really well-known calf health scoring system. It's called the Wisconsin Calf Health Score System, but they also have an app that we used. So we went out there every day and we went through these systematic criteria to look at the health status of the calves. So that wasn't the outcome we were interested in measuring for our study. We had a sample size that was sufficient to detect the effects we were looking for, but not to systematically compare health status of our different treatments, but we do report it descriptively. And we're fortunate that here our calves are very healthy in our research herd. And so I, I guess also to mention, I do often collaborate with our Vet school here, I think that's one of the other really beautiful things about working at University of Wisconsin is that we have this wonderful vet school and a lot of the veterinarians here on the faculty do research. And so that's been really great because they are also really well connected to farmers in Wisconsin and we've been able to explore welfare from this more holistic perspective with these collaborations. Any other questions? If not, which do you prefer, orange custard, Chocolate chip or vanilla? I am going to choose vanilla. I think vanilla gets a very unfair reputation. I hate hearing, you know, plain vanilla, boring vanilla, because vanilla is such a rich, complex flavor. I think it's a really important spice, so I'm going to choose vanilla. vanilla. In defense <laughs> of vanilla. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hope to see you again next week for another dairy science presentation, and we'll have another round of vanilla. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I love the name of our new chancellor's ice cream flavor. What They're so mean? clever. Munukido. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I liked, I liked the key lime pie, that too. Was that was a good one as well. This has yeah. to come a staple, Tom. Yeah, that I like the free ice cream. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's good. For 10 years on a dairy farmer. Oh, you did. Now that I've is your family still farming? No. Okay. Yeah.